over in Nigeria, Shell was ordered to pay uh, farmers for some oil spills. And uh, Stephen Donziger was on this case. Uh, here's the tweet here. Breaking in a landmark victory, Shell agreed to pay $16 million to four Nigerian farmers in a case where courts also held the fossil fuel industry legally responsible for the abuses of its foreign subsidiaries. So joining us today uh, is Stephen himself. Stephen Donziger is an attorney who uh, went up against Chevron, and they didn't like that. So they went up against him, uh, and the fight continues. Stephen, how are you? Thanks for being here. Great to be here with you, Ron. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So most people watching this, I'm, I'm sure already know who you are, but if you could just give people a snapshot into uh, what you were involved with concerning Chevron and uh, kind of a, uh, a Cliff Notes version of everything you've been through. Well, thanks. So I, I work with a team of lawyers down in Ecuador over many years uh, in a lawsuit against Chevron after the company had dumped literally billions of gallons of cancer-causing oil waste into the rainforest and decimated indigenous groups. We ended up winning the case, uh, uh, roughly a $10 billion judgment, historic victory. Back in 2009, it was affirmed on appeal by six different appellate courts, including the Supreme Court of Ecuador and the Supreme Court of Canada for enforcement purposes. Sharon then went after me um, here in New York, claimed the case was a fraud, even though it had been affirmed, you know, by various appellate courts around the world. Um, and in my opinion, they corrupted the judicial process and basically prosecuted me privately for contempt of court and had me locked up for almost three years, which ended last April. So now I'm out doing my thing as a human rights lawyer and environmental justice lawyer. But, uh, you know, I was I was targeted with the nation's first private corporate prosecution. The case is still under appeal. It was, in my opinion, very unfair. But it's a warning sign um, to everyone out there who cares about justice, cares about the climate movement, cares about our democracy, that the corporate capture of the U.S. government now extends to at least some pockets of our federal judiciary in a very direct way. Um, so, you know, we can talk more about that maybe some other time, but I'm happy now to talk if you want about the Shell case. Yeah, so so let's jump into that, because dare I say that's actually a little bit of good news, which I'm sure we can all use this holiday season. So, so what happened over in Nigeria? So this is an important case, you know, I try to keep my eye on important environmental uh, legal cases and courts around the world, just because I think the legal piece to saving our planet is often overlooked, and I think it's really important. So what happened is um, a group called Friends of the Earth, a really great environmental group, uh, the Netherlands branch, sued Shell, which at the time was based in the Netherlands, for pollution, it's one of its subsidiaries caused to uh, a handful of villages in Nigeria because of a leaking underground pipeline. And this case went on for 13 years, and it just resulted in really a very, in my opinion, landmark settlement where the company agreed to pay $16 million to four farmers and their villages to compensate them for the environmental damage caused by the leaky, leaking pipeline. Now, in the larger scheme of things, and with a company that you know has revenue revenue in the hundreds of billions of dollars every year, I recognize 16 million might not seem like that much money, but this is really significant for two reasons. One is it will make a huge difference to these communities. I mean, it will improve their situations, their lifestyles um, dramatically. And even more importantly, it creates a really important precedent because Dutch courts um, established that Shell was responsible for pollution caused by its wholly owned farm subsidiary in Nigeria. The first thing oil companies do when they get sued um, in their home country courts by people abroad who they negatively impact is they claim, oh, you can't sue us here because that wasn't us. That was our subsidiary. That's a different company. And it's, oh. it's, just, it's just a legal fiction designed to, you know, obtain impunity for human rights violations. So the fact the Dutch court rejected that in this case, which resulted in this landmark settlement, is significant not just for the four Nigerian farmers in their villages. It's significant for every environmental campaign in the world that represents 
people in other countries, usually under-resourced countries in the global south, who want to take on the big polluters in the north, like the Chevrons, the Shells, the Exxons, the BPs. So this decision in Dutch courts, while it technically only applies to the Netherlands, actually will have, in my opinion, very positive ramifications in countries around the world that um, will take on similar cases. So to me, this is very significant. It's a big victory for the movement, for the planet, for the climate movement. Do you think it's kind of a sign? Because, you know, I'll tell you an aside here, and, and, and I'm sure you can speak to this like, like, like to infinite levels. But when I uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is the, uh, you know, the land of, of fracking in western Pennsylvania right now. And when I was in grad school, I did a, a big study on just the fracking industry in the area. And I found so many cases of what you're talking about where they actually committed thousands of violations none of which were reported on. And what they did every time was they passed the buck to a contractor. They're like, oh, no, that wasn't range resources. That was this, you know, this this other subsidiary thing, this other company. So it seems like that's a common dirty trick throughout the entire oil industry. Now, do you think because of this ruling, that's a dirty trick that's not going to work anymore or is going to well, not, not work not, as much? Not, you know, Let's not get ahead of ourselves, okay? This is one important victory that I think can be cited by lawyers who fight for environmental justice in other countries as an example of how to do it. Now, in our case against Chevron out of Ecuador, where we won the case, Chevron made the same argument. They we basically they refused to pay the judgment, which is completely unethical. We then went into Canada in other countries where they had assets to enforce the judgment, to force them to pay the judgment, to force them to comply with the rule of law. And the first defense they came up with was the same defense Shell tried to use in the Netherlands, which is, wait a second, you can't sue us in Canada because in Canada we don't exist. Only our subsidiary Chevron Canada exists. And we learned that Chevron doesn't operate anywhere in the world except in the United States. I mean, Chevron's in dozens of countries operating through subsidiaries. So their argument essentially is a cheap, dirty trick to try to obtain legal impunity for massive human rights violations through some technical feature of the law that is invented. It's just invented by them. And then they try to convince courts in, you know, in the United States and Canada. You know, many of these courts have judges that come out of the big corporate law firms, pro-corporate in their orientation. And, you know, they buy it. And it's it's really a, a, a terrible thing that a corporation can hide behind its subsidiary to avoid paying a legitimate legal judgment, as Chevron continues to do in Ecuador, as Shell tried to do in the Netherlands, but got shot down by courts in that country. This is significant. Because now the Ecuadorians, when they go into Canada or any other country, and Chevron tries to pull the same dirty trick, have a precedent, an important precedent from a very well-respected country's judiciary that can blow up Chevron's defense in our case. So it helps a lot of people. Now, it's not just positive. You know, they will still pull out every dirty trick in the book to avoid paying these judgments. They hate having to do it. By the way, you know, even though Shell paid 16 million, it doesn't feel like a lot of money to a big oil company. Like they hate the idea of it. You know, they hate paying a hundred dollars. You know, their whole business model is predicated on um, basically, you know, privatizing profits and externalizing costs. And they fight really hard never to pay court judgments because they don't want these vulnerable communities filing more cases. You know, in these cases, when you win them, and we won ours in Ecuador, even though we're still fighting for Chevron to comply with that decision, in the Netherlands, Friends of the Earth, and the Nigerian villagers won their case, it's inspirational. Like, people see it. They get motivated. They get inspired. They want to do the same thing. So the oil industry tries to pull out all the stops, every dirty trick it can think of, to never pay these judgments, because they do not want these communities to think they can even win. So this is a big, big time victory for me as I look at 
the legal landscape across the world. Now, let's not exaggerate the importance of the law. I mean, it is one component piece of a much larger movement. We need campaigners, activism, and stuff in the streets, policy people. But we can't ignore the law either. And we need to use those spaces in the legal world that exist to advance the cause of the climate movement if we want to save the planet. Do you have time for one more? I know, I know you're on a time pressure. Yeah, go ahead. Go one ahead. More. So I know that the spills uh, in Nigeria or the, the pollution that, that the oil companies caused, it happened from 2004 to 2007, to my understanding. Um, is this kind of a typical timeline that they'll draw these things out for? Like, because I'm sure they put in every red tape they can, or was there a particular reason that we're just getting to this now? Like, what's kind of the anatomy of a, of a situation like that typically? Well, these cases move slowly not because they should, but because the part of the defense of the companies is to basically, you know, delay them and sabotage the normal legal processes. I mean, you know, what do they have? They have superior resources. They have money. So they pay lawyers and all these corporate defense firms. I mean, Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher uh, is the main firm that represented Chevron in our case. You know, they know what to do. They make money and they just basically delay the legal process. Just understand their goal is not necessarily to win the case. It's to make sure the plaintiff doesn't win the case. Mm. So this goes on forever. Um, that's sort of how they do it because eventually, you know, the plaintiffs lose interest or they run out of resources. Or sometimes in the case of Nigeria, two of the four plaintiffs died during the course of the litigation. Oh. 13 years is yeah. way too long. And it really shows, I think, how these oil companies with their superior resources are able to delay legal proceedings. They calculate it's cheaper to pay lawyers than to pay for the harm they caused. And they hope ultimately the plaintiffs and the lawyers will give up. And when you don't give up, ultimately you can win these cases. That's, that's the lesson here. But I will say that courts around the world, be they in the Netherlands or the United States or Canada or wherever, Judges need to not let these companies abuse the process of the law to delay the substance of a proper outcome. And we see these long, long delays in these cases. I mean, Chevron's, you know, even though we won, they've delayed paying for now 28 years since the case was first filed. And many people have died, you know, people who deserve and have legitimately won relief. So courts need to be stronger in standing up to the fossil fuel industry. Now, I know I'm just saying that because like in the United States, we basically had a federalist society takeover of much of the federal judiciary, including our Supreme Court. You know, so, so there's been a scheme that, by the way, there's a book called The Scheme just put out by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse that documents this in great detail. But there's been a whole plan by the corporate right in America you know, funded largely by the Koch brothers in the fossil fuel industry to take over our courts so they don't stand up to the industry when these cases are brought and these dirty tricks end up taking root and working. So we need a multi-pronged strategy. We need to do these cases. We need to get to courts and fight them. And we also need to understand the relationship between democracy and the climate movement. In other words, we need to work on bringing back our democracy in the United States, which is, you know, really fragile right now, or what's le left of it, yeah. precisely so the rule of law works and these companies can be held accountable. So it's all connected, but I, I will go back to the, you know, the Nigeria court decision in the Netherlands. It's, it's very significant. I mean, let's not exaggerate it. We've got a lot of work to do, but it really can have a positive impact. And by the way, a lot of momentum shifts in the law take place with these little, these little they get started by these little victories that end up being replicated in different countries and suddenly you have a movement and momentous shift and not a lot of time, but it has to start somewhere. This is a great start. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for everything you do. As I mentioned off here, I am a huge fan uh, of everything you do. And I know that uh, I dare say not every attorney in the world uses their powers for good, but you are one who certainly does uh, to the nth degree. So thank you so much for everything you do. Hey. And um, 
um, I'm honored and I, you know, we're all doing what we do and you guys do a great job checking abuses of power in your world, just as I try to do in my world. So I back at you. Thank you for what you do. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Where can people go to, to follow you if they're not already? Okay, so, you know, you, I, I tweet a fair amount about the, the Ecuador case and other cases at S. Donziger, D-O-N-Z-I-G-E-R. And then I'm also, I, I write a lot of little mini essays about the law on Instagram at Stephen Donziger. And if you want to really dig in and get involved in our campaign against Chevron, go to my website. It's um, freedonziger.com. Um, free d o n z i g e r dot com. You can donate to our defense fund. They're still attacking me, by the way, so I have legal fees. Um, but more importantly, you can learn a lot more about the case, and you can get our case updates. And we have uh, over a hundred thousand people, by the way, have joined over the last couple of years. So you know we're building something. And um, please come and, and get involved if you can. Again, it's it's freedonziger dot com. And thanks so much for allowing me to say that.